afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, this afternoon's Emmet webinar on what's going on in Israel with regard to the judicial reform. Um, I am going to make the introduction very brief because we've got a lot of uh, top issues to discuss, and we have an esteemed panel. I'm very excited to be discussing these issues with Avi Bell, who is an international uh, law professor and uh, legal expert who is gonna provide great insights to us. And of course, Jonathan Tobin, who is a prolific journalist and editor of JNS. Um, if you would like further information on their bios, you can go to our invitation. Uh, I hope to get to, to questions at the end, but we do have a lot of topics to cover. I did wanna share with everybody before we start that uh, please save the date, December 5th. We are gonna finally have our first live Rays of Light in the Darkness Gala at the Grand Hyatt in DC. We are going, it's going to be unbelievably special. We're going to be recognizing Israel's 75th anniversary and the historic Abraham Accords. And among our honorees this year will be Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, Congressman Richie Torres, and retired NBA star Inez Cantor-Friedman. So I hope you all can join us. Um, I want to start, we're going to dive right in here, uh, start with you, Avi, and ask you to briefly provide background on Israel's judicial system, explaining the judicial revolution under Iran Barak's uh, 1990s reform or revolution that led to the need for the reforms today. In that context, can you discuss the reform proposals designed to bring the court back to the pre-Barak days during which the court was more aligned with the US and other, and more, other Western democracies, including the recent law passed by the Knesset addressing the reasonableness test, which allowed the Supreme Court to overturn legislation and administrative actions, giving it enormous discretion, often with arbitrary results. So doesn't a portion of the Israeli citizenry remember the pre-Barak days when the country operated according to the British model um, and see that since Barak's judicial revolution, Israel's Supreme Court operates with authority like no other in the world? So, yeah, I, I mean, the, the public reaction is, is its own can of worms, and uh, we're going to get to that as we go along. So let me just uh, uh, address the first part of your question first. Um, and I think that this is Maybe the most important thing for uh, uh, anyone who wants to understand judicial reform to understand it. Judicial reform is not an independent movement. It's a reaction to something. It's a reaction to a very significant change that happened in Israel's legal system during the primarily during the term of Aaron Barak on the on Israel's Supreme Court. Um, he became justice in 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 1978 and left uh, stepped down in the early 2000s. Um, but it's also uh, the, his successors. Esther Hayut has only been chief justice for for about five years, um, and she has done um, in her short term um, some things that, uh, in many ways, are even more revolutionary than anything Barak did. And the, the, this, the, the whole judicial reform movement is a reaction to that. The question is: Was Israel better under its old legal system pre-Barak? Or is it better off in this new hyperactivist, juristocratic uh, uh, system? Um, now, um, the old system, um, uh, old Israelis re re will remember it. It was basically, a, as you said, a, a British uh, Westminster parliamentarian system. Par par the parliament was uh, supreme. Israel never had um, US style separation of powers. It has British style separation of powers, where a government is appointed by the, the parliament. And it stays as long as it enjoys the confidence of the parliament. If the parliament loses confidence and it can topple the government, it doesn't have to bring about new elections. So Israel has had about 25 Knessets, right, 25 parliaments, and it's had about 40 governments, right, 37. Um, and because governments are even more unstable than the parliament, and the par parliament is pretty unstable to begin with because it has proportional representation, so parliaments never last their term and there's never a majority uh, that controls the parliament. Now, that was the old system, and it produced a reasonably uh, well-functioning democratic government. Um, and then Barack decided to change things, and Barack changed the, the legal system from, from end to end. Um, it was not just his constitutional revolution. He, he coined the term, by the way, constitutional revolution, to describe the things that uh, uh, he was doing. He claimed with, with uh, authority from his interpretation of the law, but he, he coined that for things he did in the, in the 1990s. But it wasn't just that. It was private law, was the, the uh, jurisdiction of the court. It was everything uh, um, imaginable. And um, um, the the most controversial things are the things we're arguing about now. So one of the things, maybe the most controversial, is that he declared the court had the ability, 
notwithstanding the absence of a constitution to strike down legislation by the Knesset. Now, this is unknown in, in the democratic world to be able to strike down legislation without a constitution. And there's a reason for that. That, that is, a, a constitution is not just an authority for judges to, to strike down laws. It's also a limit on the powers of judges. Um, what you've seen Chayut do in the last few years is she's taken the power that Barak created and she's invented a variety of new doctrines as she goes to strike down laws, basic laws, uh, 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 delay their implementation, anything else in the sun. And it's possible to do this in a system where there's judicial review without any anchor in law, without any limit in law, because she simply makes it up as she goes along. And, <laughs> and there we are. And so, um, uh, uh, the reform is designed to clip some of the most extreme of, of Barack's uh, 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 um, innovations. Um, I, if you ask me personally, I think that it doesn't go far enough. The, the reforms, the reforms uh, that are being discussed now are not the only judicial reforms that have ever been uh, proposed. They've been proposed over the last decade, two decades. Um, and um, it, this is a, a version that's built on compromise proposals that were advanced in the past. The, the craziness that's enveloping the, the, the rhetoric about this really has nothing to do with this. We, you know, the, the basic choice that we have is still the same one that we had when the reform proposals were, were introduced several decades ago, which is, are we going to return to being a functioning parliamentary democracy like the rest of the democratic world? Or are we going to continue veering off into this path of unlimited unaccountable, unlawful power by judges um, that can do anything they want and are liable to drive us into a very, very dangerous place. Can you just also touch on, before we turn to Jonathan, I think it's important for everybody to understand how the justices are selected. Um, sure. um, yeah, so the, Israel Israel had has had over the years two different selection systems. So the initial system that Israel had was that the government proposed to nominate judges, the Knesset approved them. And then um, in 1953, um, uh, a basic law of the judiciary was, uh, was adopted and it changed the system. It basically handed over uh, um, uh, judicial selection to a professional committee, which was in the 1950s, something that was plausible because the judges had fairly limited authority. They were they were strong independent judges, strong even then by standards of, of Western democracies, but they couldn't overturn laws. They um, they knew better than to, to get into politics. They they saw themselves as bound by rules of some things like justiciability and political questions. And so then they it was handed over to committee. Now when Barack came in, he both changed the nature of the law and he changed the, the, uh, uh, the politics of selection. So he basically took over the committee. Um, uh, at the time, there wasn't a formal veto for the judges that were sitting on the committee, but now there is, right? You can't be appointed to um, the Supreme Court today without the approval of the three members of the uh, Supreme Court that are sitting on the uh, uh, committee that vote as a block. And the result was that um, Barack, on behalf of the Supreme Court, took over judicial selection to the point where the judges select themselves. Right? The, the Supreme Court is a group of judges who have so, been selected by the judges, in part because they su support this expansive notion of juristocracy. Okay, thank you. Um, Jonathan, I want to ask you, you know, what's really going on in Israel with the anti-judicial reform movement and the accompanying protests and the disruptions of daily life. I mean, what is this really all about? Bibi called the proposed reforms a minor correction to bring things back to the middle, but the left in Israel is calling reform the end of democracy. Is this really about saving democracy and real concerns about separation of powers, or is it about overthrowing the Netanyahu-led governing coalition and what I would call Bibi derangement syndrome? Or is it something even more nefarious, but related, which involves minimizing the religious majority's power? I'm sure that there are some protesters who truly believe that they're fighting for Israel's democracy. But people like uh, Gadi Taub, for instance, have described the democracy claims as, quote, a mass for ethnic prejudice, which involves a power struggle between the secular left as embodied in the liberal Supreme Court and the more religious nationalists embodied in Bibi's conservative governing coalition. I mean, to me, it seems more like a Tel Aviv versus Jerusalem, Ashkenazi versus Sephardic, deplorables versus elitist power struggle. And in fact, reminiscent of Hillary Clinton's deplorables comment, Yair Lapid actually stated, and I quote, 
Do we leave the world to the shits? Those who disgust us would win. I won't let those disgusting people run my life or the country. So what's really going on here, Jonathan? Well, Lori, thanks, number one, for, for inviting me to join this uh, very important webinar. Um, everything you just said is part of the story. This is, above all, not an argument about constitutional law, such as you know, scholars like Avi Bell and, and his you know, fellow law professors would, uh, would argue about. This is not something, you know, a, a debate between people at the Brookings Institution and the Federalist Society, if to put it in an American political context, where people talk about who's the real activist judge. This is about politics. It is about power. And this is about a power struggle within Israel that must be placed in the context of the, you know, at the very least, uh, first superficially in terms of what has been going on in Israel over the last four years. Um, we, you know, we quickly forget everything, you know, in you know, certainly everything in journalism, you know, uh, what happened yesterday is history, what happened the day before yesterday is ancient history. But for four years, Israel, you know, has been locked in this battle over whether Netanyahu would continue as prime minister. For three years, there was a stalemate, several inconclusive elections, because there were parties that were nominally on the right, had broken with Netanyahu and no longer wished to have him as prime minister. And that became the sole issue, Bibi or not to Bibi. That stalemate was broken last November when Netanyahu and his uh, religious and uh, nationalist uh, allies won for the first time in a few years, a clear majority in the Knesset election that was held on November 1st. That set up a uh, unique circumstances over the course of the last uh, generation of Israeli history because Netanyahu was not able to establish a government, um, a broad government, a government that would have some centrist, so-called centrist parties or left-wing parties as he'd always been able to do in his four previous administrations. Instead, the lines had been drawn so starkly, you know, BB or not to BB, that everybody, you know, who had uh, run on one side of the spectrum refused to join his government. He was left with his, uh, the religious Zionist party, which quickly broke into Otsma Yehudit and religious Zionists, and the two Haredi parties. Very, actually tight, unusually cohesive uh, Israeli government, uh, people who generally agreed on most issues. But that left the people who had just lost the election feeling as if the world was about to end because Netanyahu actually would remain in power and the right could actually govern or at least have the potential to govern. And so what we have seen, I mean, the, the easy analogy and it's analogies between the United States and Israel are always somewhat facile because they're two very different countries with two very different populations and sensibilities. But much like the election of Donald Trump, who you know is nothing like Netanyahu, um, in, in, but his election in 2016 set off a resistance on the left, a resistance that not only set you know a million people into the streets on the weekend of his inauguration, but also you know the Russian collusion hoax, uh, the, the whole effort by the media, by the uh, liberal political establishment, and indeed much of the security intelligence establishment to topple him. The same thing happened in Israel, but the, the, the correlation of forces, as the Soviet used, used to say, are very different in Israel. As, as much as um, American conservatives think of uh, the media being left wing in the United States, and most of it is, in Israel, it's almost uniformly left. And the political, you know, the uh, legal, academic, business, security establishment remains, you know, very much uh, identifying with the parties of the left. Um, hostile to Netanyahu, and what set what was set in motion was a resistance movement that was going into place even before the debate shifted to plans to enact, you know, judicial reform, which had been in the works, which, which had been something that Netanyahu and his allies had run on, and even so, and what happened was was that even some of the sort of low hanging fruit there were very few people in the opposition people like Lapid as well as people who used to be allied to Netanyahu like Gidon Saar who used to be strong advocates of judicial reform um, they now took any judicial reform 
as um, you know, sort of a surrender to Netanyahu, whom they wish to whom they wish to topple. They wish to delegitimize his government, and they turn the issue of judicial reform into something more than, as I say, just a constitutional battle, but actually a culture war. A war, as you uh, alluded to before, between Ash old Ashkenazi establishment and the Mizrahi majority in Israel, between secular Jews, secular liberal elites, yes, Tel Aviv, and uh, religious Jews. Um, you know, the religious parties got about a quarter of the vote in the last election. Combined with the Likud, that gave them a majority. But the uh, the liberal majority doesn't want to. The liberal minority doesn't want to accept that. And they see the Supreme Court, they have latched on to the idea of opposing judicial reform because they not unreasonably see the courts with uh, this juristic, juristocracy, this, this overweening power to basically overturn anything any government does, you know, policy appointment on any pretext under any circumstances as the way to not merely put a check on the Netanyahu government, but to prevent the right and the religious parties from going. And so the rhetoric in the streets isn't constitutional rhetoric. It's about, we don't want to be governed by the religious. We don't want them to enact, you know, ban gays, you know, oppress women, all sorts of things that, that the Netanyahu government isn't going to do. But it brought up all of the resentments, the, the cultural resentments between, as you say, symbolically Tel Aviv, which is a little more religious than it used to be, Tel Aviv and Jerusalem between religious and secular, and brought that out. But combined with the power of the media, of the sort of uniformly left-wing media, which went into you know, overdrive immediately using terms like coup to, to describe judicial reform, uh, to claim that Netanyahu was an authoritarian, even though he, you know, judicial reform would actually make Israel more de democratic. And, uh, you know, Netanyahu had just been elected. This was an elected government. And to say that overthrowing an elected government is, you know, a defense of democracy. It's kind of like gaslighting, but it's also, it's akin to the color revolutions of Eastern, of Eastern Europe in the last 20 years, where popular movements take to the streets to attempt to overturn elections. And that's what we're dealing with now, with uh, lines set really in concrete, um, fueled by culture war sentiments that actually put our, our American arguments between deplorables and sort of the uh, suburban soccer moms, you know, the stereotypes of American politics in the last few elections, really to shame. It's much deeper, it's more bitter, and um, it's created a situation where um, the uh, sort of the, those opposed to Netanyahu who have are ready to sort of endanger the country's economy, its security, and to rally foreign governments and foreign Jews, American Jews, to help them overturn this this democratically elected government in the name of democracy, which also has to do with sort of Democratic Party talking points in the 2022 election. There are, that's the, that's the overlap, but what it is is more a culture war and a war for political power in which one side, uh, the, the secular left, believes that demography is destiny and that the growing population of religious nationalist Jews, um, which led to the, the circumstances in which Netanyahu could finally win a majority, um, that that is something that the left can't win any more elections. I don't know that that's true, but that's what has driven the people into the streets when they say they're defending democracy, what they want is a particular vision of Israel in which sort of the liberal secular left governs and the religious uh, nationalist you know, uh, population just takes it, that they could win as many elections as they want, but they won't be allowed to govern. That's what's at stake in this, in this battle. And to sort of uh, claim as many um, American Jewish organizations, almost all of them, leading pundits um, who are respected as, as you know, supporters of Israel, like Brent Stevens, not scrupling to engage in this sort of culture war contempt for the majority that just voted in Israel, um, that is fueling not merely just uh, you know, street battles in Israel, but uh, the isolation of Israel in a way that I think has implications for security and for the existential battle to protect the Jewish state. Thanks, Jonathan. You've actually um, touched on a lot of points that I'm going to be raising um, 
over the next you know couple of minutes. But I, Avi, I want to expand upon um, what Jonathan touched on with the various opposition leaders, who include you know former Prime Ministers Omer Barak Lapid, who actually once supported judicial reform until the politics that that Jonathan raised. Um, and the role that they're actually playing in these anti-reform protests, the media narratives that have er erupted. Um, you know, for instance, it's my understanding that left-wing NGOs funded by New Israel Fund and including Peace Now and B'Tselem, which are all known anti-Israel organizations, they take regular advantage of the Supreme Court's lack of a standing requirement. And these groups are now taking an active role in the protests in order to ensure that they have a continuing role in directing Israel policy, despite having no official government role in, in making policy or standing in protesting policy. So they self-perpetuate the left-wing narrative or, or excuse me, nature of the court, notwithstanding the desires of the voting public, which as you've pointed out, have consistently voted for right of center government in five of the last six elections. Are the protests, Avi, being funded and organized by outside sources, whether from the Biden administration, which I've heard about, George Soros, his Open Society Foundation, advertising agencies, political strategic consultants, other influences that are fanning the flames of the civil unrest? Um, I'd, I'd rather not speculate about where the money is coming from. It's true absolutely that um, um, the uh, uh, protest movement is costly. Somebody's paying. Um, I think that's not the question to ask though, and, and primarily because both the movement for judicial reform and the movement against it are being directed in Israel. These are, it is, as Jonathan said, um, uh, about power. It, it's a little bit asymmetric. Um, the judi judicial reformers um, at least people like me who have been uh, uh, calling for reform since uh, Barack made his changes uh, uh, 20, 30, and 40 years ago, um, we're not doing this for reasons of power. We're doing this because we're trying to rescue Israel's parliamentary democracy from the uh, this aristocratic system that, that Barack set up, which I think is inherently unstable. Um, but on the other side, I, I think it, it is a, lo a lot about power. Some of it is, some of it is um, um, these sort of abstract constitutional questions of power. I think that you know the the, the court is fighting for its own power, and it's being quite uh, uh, you know our own Barack has uh, given pre press uh, interviews in which he's called on people don't give up, stay, go out there, protest, shut down the economy, whatever else. He doesn't say shut down the economy in as many terms, but it's very clear from his words that he he likes. Uh, these these disruptive uh, 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 protests, including where they disrupt transportation and the economy and the army. Um, and the, the, the idea there is to maintain the institutional power. But there's also an abstract idea, which is that he has a, a fundamental distrust of democracy. He has a fundamental distrust of the, the common masses. And uh, he believes it's it's there's a, a large degree of arrogance here, but he believes in the superior power of judges to make moral choices for everyone. And he has distrust for these politicians who listen to the masses uh, uh, making decisions as if they're in any way qualified to do so. And so that's part of the push. You know, it's about power, but it's about more. And there's also, you know, there there are these uh, um, there is uh, an elite. Ashkenazi, secular, you know, native Israeli group, primarily in, you know, in Tel Aviv and the Kibbutzim, but, you know, there's uh, elsewhere too, let's say, you know, the old labor elite. Um, there, it's also about power for them. They want the institutions where they maintain power, um, like the court to remain strong. And um, institutions, popularly elected institutions like the, 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 the Knesset um, to be weak. Um, and that's what they're fighting for. And they, they, they think that this is good because they believe themselves to be liberal, unlike the, those horrible unwashed masses that are terrible people and that against whom they, 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 they despise and they hate, but they don't view it as prejudice, right? Um, and so they want to blunt their power and you know, blunt the opposition uh, to them and uh, uh, enhance their own power. But then there's also just you know uh, uh, very mercenary uses of the power. So he asks about somebody like Ehud Barak. Ehud Barak has visions, and he says this. You know, he's got visions of a mass uprising in which there are lots of people that that die, and the the masses are yearning for real leadership, and they'll come 
to Barack and place a laurel on his head and uh, make him prime minister again. Uh, you know, his concept of what it means to be prime minister is a little bit broader than that. Uh, but, you know, he imagines himself taking advantage of a civil war to become emperor. Right. Um, and um, um, his, he's been working with many of the protest leaders for years, long before this issue came up. He identified screaming democracy as a good way to present their case, um, but it is fundamentally insincere. Right? Um, it's, uh, uh, and then you have um, um, uh, someone like Lapid, who's, who's mercenary in a different way, the way he understands it. Uh, the last government fell because there was instability in the streets and instability among the political parties. And he's trying to topple this government by making it unstable enough that there, he will be able to peel away a few members in parliament and there will be an no confidence vote. Um, and for that purpose, it's much better, chaos is much better than, than order. Um, and that's, that's really where the fight is. Um, most people that are advancing this understand that the, the, the talk about democracy, the, the groups that are claim, fighting in the name of democracy are fighting against democracy. Um, the, the judicial reform groups are fighting in favor of democracy. And it's, it's partly because the, the anti-reformers don't trust democracy because they fear the, the bad guys are going to win. Um, um, but it's partly because they just don't trust democracy at all. They just have this elitist sense of how opinion ought to be made and how decisions ought to be made in, in society. And that's the, what we're, we're fighting about the essence of Israel. It's just everybody has got the, 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 discretion, the description of this exactly reversed. Right. Um, the question is, are we going to continue in, along this path of unlimited power for an unelected elite? Or are we going to get back to um, um, the messiness of parliamentary democracy, the winner be whoever it may be? And that's a good transition into my next question for you, Jonathan. And, and I mean, part of the issue that I see is this terrible lack of messaging on the part of Bibi's government. It was my understanding that he was basically prevented from speaking about the reform proposals due to his court case and that the AG silenced him, which helped the opposition, you know, during these initial stages of protests to control the messaging. And now it seems like it's too late to walk it back. I mean, it seems to me that it shouldn't be so difficult to explain to Israelis, to American Jews, to anybody who's you know being very outspoken and, and, and participating in this process, um, that the whole effort is to bring Israeli courts more in line with the US's separation of powers, standing and other norms. And that it's the furthest thing from a threat to democracy. I mean, in that regard, you know, you've brought up the, the media and uh, Haaretz canceled Gadi Taub's regular column under the guise of defending democracy. And the paper actually forbade its writers from using the term reform, directing them to call it a coup d'etat, um, which is not only a lie, but it's an inflammatory call for civil war, in my opinion. We don't read about all the supporters of judicial reform in Israel. We don't read about the 200,000 supporters who took to the streets a few weeks ago. And there's well over 100,000 Israeli active duty and reserve military personnel on record as rejecting the calls to refuse to serve uh, with IDF military intelligence officers publishing a public call against refusal to serve calling for the IDF to remain beyond political debate. So as a journalist, why do you suppose that we don't hear about any of this in either Israeli or US media outlets? And is it still possible to reach Israelis, and I would say Americans for that matter as well, with an honest explanation of the reform proposals? Well, you, you've described the problem very well. Uh, I would just add one codicil, uh, one American outlet where you can read about it is JNS.org, <laughs> actually, American and Israeli outlet. Um, so I recommend that our viewers yes. go to JNS every day to read some of the things that you've just mentioned. But um, there are two factors here, and you, you, you've outlined them well. Number one, Netanyahu was prevented from speaking about this issue in the early stages. Um, the context for that is the, um, the force, you know, the corruption trial that has been going on in which uh, uh, Netanyahu has been charged with various uh, crimes. Um, it's been going on for more than two years. These charges are incredibly flimsy. Uh, you know, I'll just editorialize there. Um, they're based on things that really aren't even crimes in any way. Um, you know, we could spend a whole hour just discussing that. Um, the most serious of the charges, the judges have already indicated that he's not going to be convicted. Uh, 
but yet the prosecution continues because that is essentially a political prosecution. And this also illustrates you know, how, you know this, this juristocracy uh, problem that Israel has, and that it's not just the Supreme Court, although the Supreme Court and its, you know, its refusal to, you know, to sort of to listen to any norms and to rule on anything it wants on, under any circumstances, it's you know judicial advice, you know, ju you know judicial advisors to each government department, the power of the Attorney General. Um, which can over, unlike anything in any democratic government in say Britain or the United States, can overthrow, overrule the actual elected ministers, the prime minister, and sort of puts a, uh, you know, put, put hamstrings everything, all of their efforts. So he was prevented from speaking early on. He sort of shucked that off, I think rightly, should have done it earlier. But part of the problem is messaging. And part of the problem is a biased media. Um, the situation in Israel is that the uh, certainly the uh, television media, there's only one channel that isn't sort of firmly on the left using all the inflammatory bias terms that you just mentioned. That's channel 14. And, you know, the left is doing everything it can to cancel it and to to stop, you know, it's sort of um, it's not as powerful, shall we say, as Fox News is in the United States and its various right wing competitors. Um, it's much more flimsy. And um, there is a uniform kind of messaging. I mean, Haaretz is, you know, sort of more extreme than, say, Times of Israel or the, you know, Yediot or the main, Mariv, the mainstream Israeli newspapers. But even so, they have mobilized in a way sort of, um, sort of along with the other sort of establishment institutions in Israel to demonize the government, to demonize the very idea of judicial reform, to go into the sort of gaslighting where they claim they're defending democracy by actually opposing democracy. So as much as one can criticize the messaging of the government, uh, of, of how it's gone about it, that's, you know, that's, that's, that's true, but the odds were almost impossibly stacked against them in a media environment in which they were not allowed to get their message out, in which even when they did a decent job messaging, it was not heard. And that has been echoed in sort of the American coverage of this, where the liberal mainstream media and much of the Anglo-Jewish media, uh, led by outlets like Times of Israel, which has adopted the same sort of inflammatory biased terms. Um, it's much like the New York Times now in that way, and I don't mean that as a compliment. Um, so the messaging and the, the, the ability to uh, hold this debate is, very, is minimized when um, the people on one side, indeed the people that just won the election, that had the majority of votes on their side, aren't able to get their message out in a way where they can't talk about how they're mobilizing people, where the left is allowed a complete monopoly on, and it creates a certain momentum. I'm not surprised that the polls are running against the government right now in Israel, because the entire uh, public square has been dominated by his opponents in a way that is almost unprecedented, even for an Israeli system, which has always been tilted to the left in terms of media and sort of establishment uh, institutions. Um, it's gone into overdrive now because they see this as an existential question, not existential in terms of whether Israel will become an authoritarian system and they're defending democracy, but because Netanyahu's victory in the last election and the chance of, you know, these minimal attempts at judicial reform, which only really chipped away at the edges of the power of the courts, um, that this really meant that they were about to lose power fundamentally, that they would no longer have this veto over, over you know, the, the voters and you know it played into, um, as I said before, this politics of contempt, you know, of the establishment for, as you say, the de the Israeli deplorables, which is based in real issues. I mean, people, you know, sec you know, secular Jews do resent the Haredim for not serving in the army, for not playing a role in the economy. There, there are real issues there, but to say that just because you don't like them, or you don't like. The, you know, the way that sector is subsidized by, by the government and might be subsidized more, even though, of course, the institutions of the left were always subsidized by the government. And the kibbutzim were propped up for decades. Um, arts institutions, beloved of, uh, you know, the Tel Avivis, you know, they're subsidized by the government in a way, you know, just like the, the yeshivas. So, um, but what we're seeing in terms of messaging is one-sided because the side that controls these levers of power and of these, in these institutions of communications understand that this is about you know, their last chance 
to really hold on to power. It comes down to politics, power, culture war, everything goes into that. And there really are no holds barred at this point as far as they are concerned. Uh, Avi, I wanna um, turn to you to talk about the implications of all this on, on Israel in various sectors. I mean, you and I had a brief email exchange and I, and I shared with you that I always thought that Israelis had you know a survival instinct that diaspora Jews didn't, but I, I'm not I'm not so sure of that anymore. And you reassured me that yes, Israelis still have a survival instinct. Um, but I know that with my fellow conservative pro-Israel American Jews, we're all very concerned um, and see this as, as very distressing. And it makes our lives that much more difficult to defend Israel when you see the chaos that, that's going on. So, you know, we read about military reservists refusing to serve, doctors threatening to leave, tech companies pulling out. You know, it's like Israelis have their own sort of BDS movement now aimed at harming the, the country. And today I just read an, a report about um, business executives that that are encouraging, um, you know, boycotting certain acts of Israel society. So, you know, given the neighborhood that that Israel is living in, it's 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 kind of hard to to understand the the fighting among Israelis against each other. And uh, you know, can you discuss um, what these what all of this is going to do to I, the IDF's preparedness, for instance. David Weinberg wrote a column claiming that the reservist threats are greatly exaggerated, but there's also the potential economic implications given that Morgan Stanley downgraded Israel's credit rating and Moody's and S&P are issuing reports and, and whatnot. So how concerned should we be about all of these things? Um, well, let me actually start with what I didn't want to start with, uh, which is the economics first. Um, um, Morgan Stanley, um, others have downgraded Israel or issued cautions on the idea that um, Israel um, is an threatened, there's a threat to judicial independence in Israel. I think that uh, 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 Frankel, the former uh, um, the head of the Israel uh, Bank, um, said said as much. He said that we, you know, we, we, it's going to be a bad environment to in, invest in Israel because it, it, Israel is going to lose judicial independence. And he added, "I don't really know anything about that. I'm not a lawyer. I don't understand these reforms. But anyway, that's what they tell me. So let me tell you something. Um, um, any of the reforms that pass will return Israel partially to where it used to be before Barak, when it had." A strong and independent judiciary. There is not a single thing in any of the reforms that will threaten judicial independence. Um, that's not the issue. The issue is whether the judiciary will have a, a unlimited power. So, if you're thinking of investing in Israel, you actually have a buying opportunity here because the market is proceeding on the basis of a rumor that is not correct. Okay. Now that's just about the economics. Now in, in general, what do I, I think of uh, 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 the results of this? There is a threat here. It's just not necessarily where you think. Uh, and, and, and let me explain myself. You know, mo most of the people, most of the people are taken to the streets. Most of the people who are, who are uh, uh, fighting for, um, uh, against uh, judicial reform in favor of juristocracy. Um, um, they're not just suffering from a misunderstanding about uh, democracy and their centrality to governing Israel. Um, they're also they're they're not <laughs> anti-Zionist. They don't they believe they're helping the state. And what that means is that you know all my friends from the army who are now screaming at me that uh, um, uh, about judicial reform, and that uh, um, they know from reading the newspapers that. I'm wrong in the things that I've been uh, uh, researching and teaching and doing for the last uh, uh, 35 years. Um, um, when it comes down to it, if there is a military action, we're all going to forget it and we're gonna go show up and we're gonna to fight together because that's what's necessary. Um, that's not the problem. There's the, the real problem, the threat to Israel from all of this craziness in the anti-reform pro-aristocracy movement is twofold. Number one is, we understand this in Israel. All you guys out there, you do not, right? Um, the things that uh, um, the, the political activists are saying to the Jewish world, that Israel is on the tipping point of uh, of autocracy and dictatorship and the end of democracy, and that uh, uh, the court system is about to be destroyed. 
um, um, they're, they're reaching other people besides Israelis. We understand it's all political hyperbole, right? We understand it's the demagoguery that characterizes Israeli politics, right? It will be forgotten three and four years from now, um, but it won't be forgotten, um, uh, you know, in, in the UN and in the Democratic Party and among diaspora Jews, you know, the, the damage that is being done is permanent. And it's not going to be fixed. Um, and you know the the damage that's being done by trying to talk down is is the Israeli economy, by trying to uh, uh, talk down the, the, to everybody else the uh, uh, democratic system in Israel. Go go uh, bring charges against our soldiers. That is not things that we can fix afterwards. And that's that's threat number one. Threat number two is even more serious, and that's the reason there is a judicial reform movement, and that is the danger to Israel's democratic institutions from the juristocracy. I mean, right now we're having a debate, and we're going to I guess we're going to talk about this as we go along. But the, the, we're having a debate about whether the court is going to set aside law, laws of the judicial reform. It's just going to say th they don't count. They may have been duly passed by the by the Knesset according to every law, but we disregard them because we think they're not good. Now, if that happens, if the court says that it is setting aside the rule of law and it is setting aside democratic decision-making about laws and tells the public, the roughly half the public that voted for this government, their voice does not count. That sets a, 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 a very dangerous atmosphere. You can't tell half the people that no matter what do what happens, their voice never counts. You can't tell them they can have elections. They If they lose, they lose. If they win, they lose also. Um, and the destruction of Israel's democratic institutions by a runaway court is also, it's, it's fixable. But we're getting to the last minute before it can be fixed, before something really terrible happens. And that's where the real threat is. Avi, I'm going to ask Jonathan a question, and then I'm going to come back to you to elaborate on this upcoming uh, Supreme Court decision on the reasonableness decision um, or, or law. But um, Jonathan, while we had I had raised the issue with Israel's military, I, I just want to ask you, I mean, isn't it really a coup d'etat when the Israeli security organizations are used as levers of political pressure on the government, which is actually the true threat to Israeli democracy? And Avi's raised important points here about what is really a true threat to Israel's democracy. I mean, there was a, a, a letter signed by 50 generals who were heroes of Israel and top commanders who describe what's going on as crossing all red lines of acceptable behavior and as sapping the resilience of Israel and of the integrity of the IDF as a true people's army. In this context, what happens if the protest protesters actually get their way? I mean, how does democracy by protest work? And how can any future right-wing government ever again govern lest they attempt policies that the left doesn't like? Wouldn't capitulating set a, a dangerous precedent? Well, you're exactly right. It is a very dangerous precedent, and not just for future right-wing governments, but for future left-wing governments as well, because there are plenty of people in the military who are not sympathetic to the left. Increasingly, I mean, up until you know recently, uh, the lament from sort of the secular establishment was that um, the higher ranks of the IDF were increasingly filled with sort of religious Zionists, that they these people were replacing the old kibbutznik elites who you know, filled all of the you know, elite commando, air force um, uh, positions, um, and that the army was becoming more right wing and more religious, which scared them. Um, obviously, you know, and indeed a lot of the people who've been signing the anti-judicial reform petitions from, from the point of the army are actually retired officers and you know, sort of people who are not currently involved. But yes, of course, there was an, there was an, an article in Haaretz which actually described what was going on as a military coup, although they thought it was a good military coup. They thought it was you know, right that the, the military had to step in to protect uh, the rule of the left because otherwise then it's not democratic. It's sort of like the old Tammany Hall uh, you know, in New York uh, expression, if they don't win, it ain't democratic. Um, so that, that you know, clearly it's an attempt by people within the military to exercise a veto over the civilian power that 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 is incompatible with democracy and it, you know it goes further listen you know when gaza you know the gaza settlements were evacuated in 2005 
um, you know, religious Zionists and, you know, sort of right-wing officers who didn't, you know, and soldiers who didn't agree with this still showed up. They still carried out their orders. It still happened. Um, if there are future governments that are left-wing uh, in Israel, and, you know, I, you know, and nothing is set in, you know, everything as I was taught, you know, when I studied history at Columbia University a long time ago, everything in history is inevitable. It's not inevitable that the right is going to win every election in the future any more than it would be for the other, for the other side to win everyone. And what they have now said, in, you know, they've set a precedent or about to set a precedent in which, you know, the army can intervene against uh, the, the, the politics, a, a decision of the left, if that was the way uh, it went. Um, that's unacceptable. And that's why that is a red line it, that shouldn't be crossed in any democracy. The civilian power must always rule. Now, politics and the, you know, has always been involved in the Israeli military. If you know your Israeli history, you know that the army has always been uh, very deeply involved in politics. It was sort of populated by uh, members of the Mapai, the old labor Zionist establishment. Gradually that changed. But it is something that should not be allowed. It is something we would not countenance in the United States for a moment, no matter the issue, you know, that sort of this seven days in May, uh, if I can bring up an old movie novel, uh, you know, precedent, maybe uh, people haven't seen it on TCM, but you know, it, this is the kind of coup uh, mentality, regardless of the, you know, the, the gaslighting misleading terms used by the press that, creates a real danger for the country. Now, I agree with Avi, I, I, you know, most of these people who are going, who are protesting, you know, if there is a real, there is another war, if Hezbollah starts a war, there's another exchange with Gaza, people will show up. The, you know, the communitarian spirit in Israel is still intact. But I also, I do agree with him that the propaganda that is being spewed in the United States by many people who claim to be supporters of Israel, whether it's people like Brett Stevens or Max Boot just the other day in the Washington Post, who said that Israel is becoming a disgusting country, I can't support it anymore. Um, this will have real effect on the alliance with the United States at a time when it is under threat from the rise of the intersectional left within the Democratic Party. Um, there are real tangible security consequences to it that go beyond whether people are actually going to show up to fight in Israel. And that's what those who are sort of lighting the match to, to this fire should be considering. I just want to add that Max Boot also said that about America when, when Trump won. So um, I don't know. An, he's he's an angry guy. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Avi, you raised an, an important point and I, I'm going to, um, you know, time is ticking by here. So I want to jump ahead to this, because I think this is a really important question to ask you. The Israeli Supreme Court, and that's all 15 justices, are going to hear petitions next month seeking to overturn the new reasonableness law that the Knesset passed. Um, it's a farce, in my view, as the court will be determining its own jurisdiction without a constitution to guide it. And while it has a clear conflict of interest, there are also unelected judges possibly overturning a, a, a law passed by elected policymakers if that occurs. Carolyn Glick quoted you as stating, quote, a parliament asserts its authority by passing laws. By annulling the Knesset's power to enact laws, the court is destroying the last vestiges of Israel's democratic institutions. First, what are the chances the court is going to actually uphold this, given the nature of the court? And second, how can the country withstand a decision to overturn this law? And how can it also withstand the protests that will ensue with either decision it makes. I mean, it seems to me that this is a lose-lose scenario, which actually proves the need for judicial reform, but the fear is that whatever decision is reached, civil war could erupt. Is that a realistic fear? Uh, yes, but let, here, let me just explain something. Uh, the court is not being asked to decide on its own jurisdiction. There is a law. The, the court is being asked whether it's going to respect the law that just got passed. And um, just convening the hearing with 15 judges is the court telling us, no, it will not, right? It, it views, the, the court is telling us it already views this as an open question, right? It's on, it, it, whether the law is, is to be regarded as binding or not is not up to the Knesset. It's not up to the parliament to pass the law and make it a law. No, it's up to the court to pass its superior judgment, not on the basis of law, but on the basis of decisions about whether it conforms with the principles of Israel as the court understands it, 
or whether the, the Knesset was um, acting out of proper morals or a motives as the court understands it, or um, uh, whether the, the Knesset conducted a proper debate as the court understands it. Those are the things that the court is going to be evaluating. On that basis, it'll decide either we're gonna let it stand as law or we're not going to let it stand as law. Now, uh, uh, the truth is we, we've already passed this point where the court has already said that it is beyond the law. The law is not something that, that will restrict the power of the court. And we saw this about three years ago when um, there was uh, uh, one of these indecisive elections in which the, uh, the left won 61 votes and the, the right won 59. Uh, so with 59, Netanyahu could not put together a coalition on the right. With 61, the left couldn't put together a coalition either because it re would require including members of Arab parties that other members of the left were not going to go, go along with. Um, and so there was, there was, there were, the left had a, a parliamentary majority without the ability to put together a government. They came up with a plan. Yair Lapid came up with the plan of, of, of postponing elections, right? Preventing the automatic fall of the parliament, postponing elections, and, uh, uh, but putting in, uh, uh, in order to do that, they need to put in a new speaker. The speaker was a holdover from the Netanyahu government. Without the speaker, they couldn't put forward their legislative proposal to postpone uh, um, uh, uh, the elections. And so um, they went to court and asked the court to order new elections for a speaker. Now, the, the, the rules of the Knesset are very clear. You don't have elections for a Knesset speaker until the gov new government is presented. Um, and so the, the, the speaker, Yuli Edelstein of the Likud party said, I'll hold the elections when the rules require me to do so. So the court said, yeah, we know that's what the rules say, but nonetheless, you have to hold them now. And so Edelstein resigned rather than fo follow that order. The court reconvened, it fired him, appointed a temporary speaker and ordered a new vote on, uh, you know, two days later on the Friday, um, a, a vote for Knesset speaker. And at that point, um, uh, Gantz and Netanyahu uh, cooked up a deal to stabilize the, uh, the situation. They came up with a, with a unity government and set aside the, uh, the machinations of the court. But the, the court has already done this. Well, I should be more precise. The Hayut court has already done this, right? Where, Chayut has a particular uh, uh, personality in judging cases like this, which is um, um, where she sees a brick wall in front, she speeds up. And so um, there is a real, real danger that the court will not only having expressed the opinion already by convening this 15 judge panel to say that it disregards the law, they're not only they'll say the law doesn't count, but they will declare that it is, the law is unconstitutional under this invisible constitution that only the courts and its judges uh, can see. Now, what happens at that point? Well, the, what happens at that point is it's not a question of the Haredim. You know, the Haredim are a minority in Israeli society, and they're fairly uh, 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 um, autonomous and independent and non-minority uh, 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 that's not interested in conflict. They're not the problems. The problem is the rest of the half of the country, you know, primarily uh, uh, Jews of MENA or origin, you know, Middle Eastern, North African Jews, um, uh, religious Jews that uh, uh, serve in the army. Now, here they, you have the, these groups that, that for decades have been trying to br break through the glass ceiling. And they try to do this by playing according to the rules, right? They, they the, you know, the religious Jews uh, volunteer for the most dangerous army service but then they get up to a certain level of officerhood and they can never be promoted, right? They go, they, they go into uh, uh, academia and unless they um, um, uh, whiten themselves, they can't uh, uh, go any further. Um, th they, they, they try to strengthen the courts. This is a Begin strategy with the idea that the rule of law will help them. And, but then the court turned around and rejected the rule of law and, and brought in the prejudices of the uh, uh, social and ethnic class to which they belong. Um, and the last thing that's available to them is democracy, is voting for their people and getting laws passed. Now, if the court throws that away too, and it looks like that's where we are, um, the, that makes a group, a large segment of society, absolutely desperate. Every opportunity that they see in front of them to follow the rules does not help them. 
And it is basically instructing them to not follow the rules. That is a very, very dangerous thing to do in a society. Right? I, 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 I fear that we are there and I don't know what will happen next. Yeah, I, I mean, it's it, it's frightening to watch as an outsider, but it's 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 crazy because every headline and article that I read, you you see, um, you know, BB is going to have to follow what the court decides with regard to this reasonableness law passed by the Knesset, as opposed to the court having to respect the laws passed by the Knesset. And there's it seems, as I said, it's like a lose lose situation. Um, we don't have a lot of time, but Jonathan, I want to ask you a very, what I think is a very important question that I'm sure our, um, our listeners want to, want to hear. Uh, do you believe, or, or how do you believe both Israel's allies, and in particular, you know, it's Abraham Accords allies, which, uh, you know, in Saudi Arabia is now, you know, discussions about bringing them in, and its enemies, including all of the Iranian proxies like Palestinian Islamic Jihad, Hamas, and Hezbollah, how do they all perceive this unrest in Israel? I mean, I've seen calls for the terrorist organizations to unite now that Israel is dealing with so much domestic unrest. Do you think Israel is more vulnerable to attack? And do you also think it's more vulnerable to international condemnation, which will add more pressure for compromises with the Palestinians? I mean, the Biden administration is putting a tremendous amount of pressure on Israel to make concessions while it simultaneously berates Israel for the judicial reform proposal. So is there a role that America's playing in this? And I know we don't have a lot of time left, but I, that's a, a loaded question, if you could touch on that. Yeah, that's a very complex set of circumstances. Yeah. I would, instead you know, sort of trying to take it in order, I, I think when we're talking about the Gulf states, <clears throat> United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, I don't think they really care about Israel's domestic politics. I mean, they'll do business with anybody who's running Israel. Uh, they don't care which side um, wins Israeli elections. They don't care whether the Supreme Court of the Knesset is the supreme power in Israel. Um, they're going to continue. That they they um, they have embraced Israel to the extent that they have because it's in their interest to do so, not because they're Zionists, not because they love a particular vision of Israeli democracy. Let's, let's bring up that. The terrorists, similarly, they you know the, the Hamas and Hezbollah, their Iranian patrons, they hate Israel. They hate the Jews. That uh, they really make no distinctions between Ehud Barak and 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 Benjamin Netanyahu in their minds. It's all the same thing. They are always do. I think we should always assume that they are always doing their worst. That they are always seeking to undermine Israel. Always looking to attack any weaknesses to the extent that this is. Uh, showing some weakness, they will try to exploit it. But the power differential there, thank God, is still so great that I don't believe that Hezbollah, you know, would risk a war simply because, you know, people are demonstrating in Tel Aviv. They know very well that the consequences for Lebanon for them are enormous and, and generally negative. Um, so again, I don't want to be complacent about threats because these threats are real. Uh, the need to expand uh, the circle of peace is real, but that's not the problem here. The problem here is the delegitimization of Zionism in Israel. That's the that's the fire that the uh, anti-judicial reform, the anti-BB resistance, uh, has lit, and this has given real um, strength. This this is a a a, a gift to the an intersectional anti-Zionist left in the United States and in the international community. Um, you know, the idea that Israel was a democracy was something, you know, that was a shield that Israel had. It was real, it was obviously dismissed by, you know, people who hate Israel, anti-Zionists, they didn't care. But when you have people who claim to be defenders of Israel, who claim to love Israel, like the, Jew the establishment, the organized Jewish world, the Jewish federations, um, you know, the Anti-Defamation League, all, you know, the American Jewish Committee, if they're throwing shade on Israeli democracy because they are taking side with the leftist establishment, that undermines their case to defend Israel. When, when pundits, again, I, you know, people like Brett Stevens, who have tremendous prestige within the Jewish community and, you know, in, in American politics, or Max Boo, who has less prestige for good reason, um, you know, all of them, they are they are undermining the case for Israel. If Israel is only to be defended when certain people run it, you know, when the majority of Israelis are kept out of power, you know, that this politics of contempt for Jews, for the undesirable, for, you know, for, for the deplorable Jews, this, you know, this just plays into the, the hands of those who see Israel as an 
as a colonial implant, a, a, an expression of white privilege, a racist oppressive state. This makes the arguments for dissolving the American alliance with Israel, for um, attacking Israel, all the more strong. And that is the real danger here in terms of outside forces. That's who they are strengthening. They're not strengthening democracy. They're not strengthening Israel. They're undermining the case for Israel in a way that gives real material aid and effort to those who hate it. Hey, there's one question that actually um, gets to your point, Jonathan, and we're not going to get to the questions, unfortunately. I'm sorry I didn't get to all of mine either, but um, somebody asked about supporting the FIDF. They were confused about, you know, conflicted about whether to continue to support and donate to the FIDF. And I just want to make the point that, yes, you should absolutely continue to donate to the FIDF. The IDF is 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 going to protect Israel, notwithstanding what, what's going on here. So to that person, I just had to had to respond to that question. And uh, we're, we're running over time. I, I can't thank you both enough, Avi, Jonathan. We could have talked for another hour for sure about, about all of these issues. And I thank everybody who listened in. I think this is an important webinar. We'll, we'll send around the link. Please share it far and wide. Um, and thank you all for taking the time to join us today. Again, Avi, Jonathan, thank you a million. Thank you. Thank, thank you to Emmett and its members and supporters. And, and JNS. <laughs>